So I hope in this thankfully last presentation of the day that I'll be able to provide a partial but very selective answer to the question of what can we do and how to do advocacy. This is going to be a very fast-paced presentation which will in a way metaphorically reflect the intensity and pace of this physician-led fight against the IFH cuts to which Audrey and a number of people have referred. Now, at about 10.30 in the morning on April 23rd, 26th rather, 2012, I got an email when I was Chief of Family Medicine from a staff person in our department with information from somebody who I hardly knew named Dr. Meb Rashid about drastic cuts to the interim federal health program and what can we do about it. Um, thankfully, Audrey's reviewed this already, but the government put out this incredibly, unimaginably incomprehensible matrix of different extents of coverage depending on where the refugee came from, what category of refugee they were, where they were in the refugee migration process, etc. <clears throat> there was a notorious Citizens Immigration Canada document that didn't last more than a week on its website before they quickly took it down because it had things like pregnancy, treatment, none. So this also applied to kids, people having heart attacks, and it was quite shocking to me. So within, a few, I guess, about an hour, I called Meb, and by 8.30 that evening, we had a plan to raid a government office for the purpose of attracting attention and raising profile about the cuts because they weren't being discussed by any, no one knew about it except for the few refugee doctors. So besides deciding on an action, and there are emails, I'm just showing you one of the dozens that flew around that same day within 10 hours. We made contact with the media and had a story planted on the day of our protest, which is May 11th, which kind of set up the action. The action hadn't happened yet, but CBC covered it in the morning. So two lessons. One is dramatic action to bring attention to the issue, and two is use, which we did throughout the four years of the media. So on May 11, 2012, these are photos of doctors in white coats walking down Bathurst Street to the Minister Joe Oliver's constituency office. He was the highest ranking cabinet minister in Toronto, Minister of Finance at the time. It's quite an amazing scene to see, actually. This is when he went into his office. A third of the group, only 30 people could fit in the office. 90 doctors actually showed up to this pr protest, including the most senior academics in the city. There's a neurosurgeon talking outside. Uh, about a, half a dozen police officers are, uh, came to the constituency office, but when they realized there's a bunch of doctors, they quickly left just four officers. They didn't feel particularly threatened by the action. <laughs> and there's a group of us, 90 of us outside at the end of it. And I'm now going to ask that the video be played. And I'm going to have to cut this off after a while, so I stay within my time limit. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it seems fairly extraordinary to me that, that on behalf of the minister, you would not arrange a meeting not only with his constituents, but with physicians, many of whom are in different disciplines across the city, to discuss serious concerns. There's a proposition by the government right now that's going to deny many refugees coming here, some from camps directly, medications like insulin for diabetes, and if you look at this policy, it's really quite fantastic. I mean, I'll show it to you because you're not familiar with it. I mean, just listen to this. There are scenarios the federal government puts out. This is from Citizen Immigration Canada, so I'm not making up the document. Mm -hmm. And then for refugee claimants from countries not designated as refugee producing or rejected claimants, rejected refugee claimants, the sections here called medical emergency. Listen to this, doctors. Medical emergency dash heart attack. Then it says, Coverage provided based on client status for heart attack, none. None for heart attack. How can that be in Canada, an official document, 
the federal government puts out a document that says that people having heart attacks is not going to provide medical coverage for them, or insulin for diabetics. If you can't come today, we'd appreciate a meeting. Maybe he could phone in. We can deliver our message to him, and then the meeting would be over. But you're not even going to permit a meeting to happen. So it's a bit frustrating for us. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. hey, doctors, you're going to have to go outside. The yeah, member of parliament's not here. So I've spoken to one of the organizers outside. It's okay to protest on the sidewalk. But inside the office, once the person wants you outside, you have to go outside, okay? Can I just mention, as, as a constituent, I'm disappointed that my MP has a policy that you won't to instruct you not to contact him when I'm here to speak with him. I think that it's very, as a constituent, to discover that I can't ask you, that he won't take a phone call to, for you to let him know what's happening is very disappointing. I appreciate that. We do have a letter that we're going to leave with you on behalf of the organizing committee, on behalf of all of us, that you can deliver to Mr. Oliver with a contact phone number to arrange a follow-up meeting. Here it is. Will you commit to delivering it to Mr. Oliver? I will deliver it to him. Okay, no, thank you. are okay. We have friends now and colleagues in Ottawa who are marching on Parliament Hill as we speak. Uh, I just got a text message from uh, colleagues in Winnipeg who are actually at the CIC office. Uh, there's a press conference being held right now as we speak in London, Ontario. There's uh, colleagues in Montreal, in Newfoundland, who've, uh, who've released press releases as we speak, uh, supporting what we're doing. Uh, there's folks... In it's not the first time I've had to shut down Dr. Rashid, but anyway... <laughs> We got an incredible amount of media coverage, so the strategy succeeded. So we brought attention to it. We got immediate coverage before and after. And the third step was getting the endorsement of eight national healthcare associations who all have been communicating with the minister, Jason Kenney, opposing these cuts to refugee health care. And that eventually came to over 20 different national reputable health associations, which is really a critical element I think a lesson for the Academy, if you're going to take any action that seems directly political. We were pretty novice, and we didn't even have a name at this time, by the way, but we did organize as a follow-up a National Day of Action, which eventually included 14 cities across the country in June 2012. It's pretty amateurish. I just want you to remember this. I'm going to show you a more updated version later. Uh, got a lot of coverage after the National Day of Action, and we finally decided, you know, we better establish a group so we established a group called Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care. It was incorporated, had a steering committee nationally. And we decided, well, we had a National Day of Action. We raided an office. What else can we do? We decided to have a national campaign of disrupting conservative cabinet ministers as they made announcements, as long as it didn't have to do with kids or women who had been abused, but sports activities, for example. And uh, we got a notice, poor Joe Oliver, that he was coming to the Toronto General Hospital in June 2012, and here's what happened. Announcement has the potential to help medical facilities like Toronto General, patients across Canada, and the field of medical imaging worldwide. Minister <clears throat> Oliver, doctors in this country will not remain silent in the face of the concern. Well, I'll, I'll answer those, those questions the after my announcement. To the refugee health program. I will These be very happy to answer those the questions the after. Of the most vulnerable members of our society, refugees who are coming from war-torn countries, fleeing hatred, fleeing crimes against humanity, and your government is about to cut the very essential medicines and very essential services that these people require in order to continue living. This is not the legacy of Canada. This is not the kind of country that we want to live in. I am not alone. We have medical associations across this country, the CMA, the OMA. All of these organizations are denouncing your government's cuts to the interim federal health program. Perhaps, what, do you have, what do you have to say for yourself? Perhaps we could give the, the minister the privacy of finishing his remarks, and I'm sure... The minister will be disrupted from this point on. Members of the Conservative government will be disrupted from this point on by Canadian doctors I across this country. You question. Do you across want an this country. Do you want an answer to your question? Please, please do. Okay. The answer to the question is that our government believes, as most Canadians believe, uh, that all Canadians should be given the same health care. Uh, uh, and we do not believe uh, that people who just arrived, uh, recent uh, refugees, should be given superior health care 
to that of Canadian residents and Canadian citizens. We are equalizing the health care so that everyone in this country is treated equally. Minister, you well know that there okay. are folks on Ontario works to receive very similar benefits as refugees coming to this country. Refugees are coming well, to I, I, country. Okay, I've, I've, I've answered the question. Off, you are cutting off maternal please, benefits. Please, please, A sorry. pregnant woman will not be able to get health care because of you. A pregnant woman. A diabetic will not be able to get insulin. Will come into my emergency department with diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, do you think that's going to save money for this country? So, this this is a not. this is an important announcement for Canadian patients. I understand. And who required? No, I'm you are interrupting, on. and I'm rather embarrassed on behalf of our hospital that we have a representative of the Canadian people here who is unable to announce something that's very important for Canadian patients. I'd ask you, doctor, if you are a doctor. I'm a please take your seat and please show the minister the courtesy that I don't believe this minister deserves my courtesy or the courtesy of any doctor in this country. Minister, we apologize to you and we're going to conclude this announcement. You've destroyed it. For Canadian patients, you've ruined this announcement. Thank you. For, ca for Canadian refugees, this minister has Bob, ruined no, potentially their lives. Much. Appreciate it. Um, so we were a bit edgy. How would the establishment mainstream profession react to this? And uh, so we're going to go back. Well, in fact, uh, Dr. John Hagee, I think I'm pronouncing the name correctly, who's president of the Canadian Medical Association, sent a congratulatory email to Dr. Christopher Kiefer, who is a doctor who, with a medical student, led this interruption. So, five minutes. It's going to be, uh, give me seven. <laughs> this, this thing started me early, I think. Anyway, I'll go as quickly as I can. So. We brought the scholarship in. One of our academics um, set up a uh, monitoring system where doctors and healthcare workers across the country could report consequences of these cuts. It was called Refugee Homes, I think an appropriate title. We also got editorial support from the Globe and Mail. We brought in traditional scholarship. These are just pages from a CIHR grant that was successful, involved some of the speakers today and Rick Glazer from Toronto. This is a letter of support from St. Michael's Hospital for the CHR grant. In the meantime, other articles were published in peer-reviewed journals. I'm just trying to show that this is a bit academic. This is a very important article on uh, sick kids, the effect on sick kids' hospital and children. Uh, medical students are doing academic projects on these cuts. When the Calgary Herald supports you, you know you're okay. And, uh, <laughs> In the meantime, again, the Toronto Star did an editorial, Globe and Mail did an editorial. We also got support from 50 artists across the country who signed a letter endorsing our position. Religious groups, Catholic Health Alliance of Canada, the wonderful Sisters of St. Joseph of, of Toronto. Then, as Audrey's talked, we, we became a co-litigant at the Federal Court of Canada, which is the court kind of below the Supreme Court, challenging the constitutionality of the cuts, did a press release about it, at a press conference about it. I think that's you, Audrey, isn't it? <laughs> we all looked a lot younger then. All of us. And again, it got lots of media coverage. Here's Jason Kenney's response to our legal challenge. In the end, by the way, Jason Kenney got bit really hard with this, and uh, that's what he claimed. I don't, I, six, six of our speakers today are in this photograph, because they all participated in these protests. Uh, these are militant. I think some of these organizations would be quite surprised. The College of Family Physicians of Canada put it best in this very understated public release. Uh, editorial in the Canadian Medical Association Journal by Matthew Stanbrook, very helpful. Look at this artwork now. It became quite sophisticated. We had a real name. We had an artist in Winnipeg who uh, did these posters for us. We actually ended up having four national days of action. Then we found out we were being monitored by security forces in the country. We made it onto the list. You know, I didn't know the stethoscope became the latest weapon of mass destruction, but anyway, we made it. They're monitoring us. It didn't really scare any of us. It was completely ridiculous. July 4th, 2014, the decision came out. All I saw, I just started a clinic at 8.30 in the morning. I saw the bottom. The lead lawyer had not read the decision, but quote, we won. This is Anne McTavish, a justice of the Federal Court of Canada. I'm just going to not read these out because of the time limitations, but her language is more scathing than any language the Canadian Doctors of Refugee Care use in denouncing the government, denying life-saving medications. 
trying to make the lives of disadvantaged individuals even more difficult to deter them from coming here. All the arguments that you, you heard from Audrey today that the cuts in, in jeopardizing the health, safety, and the very lives of innocent, vulnerable children in a manner that shocks the conscience and outrages our standards of decency. This is a federal conservative government they're talking about, just remember. This isn't uh, some criminal organization. <clears throat> Violated the charter. Oops, sorry, let me go back. And addressed some of the arguments about bogus refugees and queue jumping. She addressed every single argument the government made and dismissed them. And of course, more Globe Mail coverage. Then, I'm almost done here, the election was coming on. We figured we had to do something in the election, so we had what was called a National Week of Reckoning with, again, our beautiful poster by our friend Krishna in Winnipeg. Uh, a one week of protest that made it twice on the CBC National Radio News that week. So we viewed that as a success. And here, photos, poor Joe Oliver got it again. He got defeated. I think he was quite relieved to get defeated in the next election. <laughs> This is the office of Chris Alexander, the then Citizenship and Immigration of Canada minister with a bunch of medical students who went down to Oshawa, was it? Oshawa. And he wasn't there. I mean, he had kind of shut down Shaw weeks earlier because he knew he was going to lose. But we decided to leave some decorations on his windows. Then I realized this is completely illegal, and here I am responsible for a bunch of medical students. I phoned up Clayton Ruby, who I kind of know. I said, Clay, look what I've done. I'm, I'm breaching every university rule or taking medical students and defacing property said, there's some phrase called de minimis, yes. <laughs> which means it's so trivial, no one's going to do anything about it, so don't worry. <laughs> but the students are worried, and I was able to reassure them. I do have to say, by the way, I meant to mention this, that at the third and fourth National Day of Actions, the University of Toronto, led by Dean Whiteside, did something no other faculty of medicine had done to that point in time, which is they officially, through communication, <clears throat> released all faculty of medicine learners from the usual academic and clinical duties so they could have the choice of attending the National Day of Action. And that continued in the final day, and other universities followed suit. So kudos to you, Dean Whiteside. I know this is not America, but you're still the dean as far as I'm concerned. And uh, this is Dr. Holland at Pier 21. Remember that, Tim? <laughs> Drove a truck up there and parked it there. And this is, I think, Vancouver. And then we got the news that the Liberals promised to restore refugee health coverage. And this is my final slide. They finally did in uh, May 2016 their full restoration of the interim federal health program. And so the conclusion to all of this is that one has to raise the profile and bring attention through whatever ways they can, especially when the government's trying to hide this. They brought this cuts in through an order in council, not through legislation, so no one knew about it except almost by accident. It requires sustained national protest and political pressure. The support of professional associations, religious groups, artists was really critical as far as giving us credibility. Editorial media support, another important element. Scholarship, the academy, learners played critical roles not only in organizing but in doing research and publishing articles in peer-reviewed journals. The legal challenge, of course, is another element in the strategy with the help of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. And finally, I think the lesson for a quarter or half a generation of medical students and residents was that in a democracy, it is perfectly fine to confront the raw power of governments of the state whose policies are hurting people and making them sick. Thank you for so patient listening to me.